Hello everybody, um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I'm Liliana Dadaniska, I'm Education Coordinator for BGCI and I'd like to welcome you all to the very first Communities in Nature webinar. Um, the aim of this series is to create a space for some of the leading prof professionals working in the area of social justice and inclusion to share their expertise to support others to grow the social role of their botanic garden. This afternoon, we are honoured to have Ian Edwards from Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. Um, Ian has many years experience working in public engagement and his passion and creativity has led Edinburgh to be world renowned for its accessibility and work with hard to reach audiences. So without further ado, um, here's Ian Edwards who will tell you about how to make your garden accessible. Ian. Okay, thanks very much Liliana and thanks everybody for uh, joining us for this webinar. It's my first webinar so I hope we could be able to get through the sort of technical side of things. Um, first of all, I guess you're in various parts of the world looking at the list of people there so I thought I'd just tell you what it's like in Edinburgh today. Uh, it's still spring with us. I've just been out inside in the garden. I picked some rhododendrons to prove that it is spring and that's what spring looks like in Edinburgh. And um, we're just hoping we're going to get some warm weather coming soon. Uh, what I want to do today is, I've been asked to talk about access, uh, but I'm going to start with actually a, a party invitation. Uh, we're very excited at the moment because we are just in the midst of opening a new building. Now, hopefully you can see that. Uh, that right you can you can see the picture of our new botanics garden cottage i say new but this is a building that was first created for the botanic garden over 250 years ago in when the garden was at an old site and very and over the last few years we demolished this building from the old site which is now going to be redeveloped as a hotel we marked all the stones and all the timber. We brought them across about a mile across the city to our current location right in the middle of our community garden and we rebuilt it. And the reason I'm showing you all of this, apart from to emphasize our community function, um, is, is to uh, invite you to a party. So if we could go back to that and move one on, there we are. On Monday, we've got a party, and as it says here, you're all invited. So I know for some of you, that will mean a bit of travelling, but I hope you'll be able to make it across to the Botanic Garden next week. And I'm going to start next with a little bit of, of our history, just to put uh, things into context. We began in 1670, nearly 350 years ago, and we began with a very strong community agenda. So back in the 17th century, unless you were extremely rich, you wouldn't go and see a physician. If you were ill, you would go and see an apothecary. And apothe apothecaries were, were barefoot doctors who used to help the, the general public. Um, and most of what they were dispensing from their apothecary shops were based on plants. So two Edinburgh doctors set up a little plot in the middle of the city in which they could bring the trainee apothecaries on a Saturday morning and they could teach them how to identify plants and how to how to use them. So there was a community function right there at the beginning, and I like to think that that tradition has has carried on to the to the present day. Um, of course, somewhere along the the way, it, it may have um, fallen by the wayside. I uh, the science of taxonomy and systematics. Uh, really began to dominate during the, the the 19th century and became paramount during the 20th, the 20th century and, and only really now during the 21st century have we gone back to seeing the community and access and inclusion as important items to, to discuss. I've actually been in the garden myself for 30 years and I've seen a very big change. For example, when I started here at the garden, it was forbidden, it was against the bylaws to have a picnic in the garden. Now, as you all know, picnics are absolutely essential for any kind of social function. So the fact that picnics were banned just goes to show how little we were really 
considering the, the, the public, the visitors, the community, and how important we thought that our surroundings were and, and how protective we were of the, of the garden and the living collection. I think that has been completely reversed now. Um, just as a, a aside, a, a, a friend of mine who works at Edinburgh University and is head of the Department of Environmental Education was offered a chair by Edinburgh University just a few years ago and he was asked for a title and the title he gave was he wanted to be the professor of picnics because he realized just how important picnics were for uh, for social engagement with people and um, I have to say that Edinburgh University were a bit stuffy about this one and refused to, to give him the title that it asked for. So let's uh, see if I can move the slides on, we hope. Yeah. Okay, as part of the, uh, as part of the of our changing role, I'm very pleased to say that we were included in the Communities in Nature program, which was uh, organised by BGCI in collaboration with the Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation. And that really has marked a big turning point for us in recognising this not just as a role, but actually as one of the prime roles of the, of the Botanic Garden. It started in a fairly modest way, but of course it's grown enormously. And I wanted to um, now throw out my, my first question. Um, the Communities in Nature program has, has embraced the, the Botanic Gardens social, social role. That was its intention. And I want to know whether, from your perspective, from speaking from, on behalf of your garden, whether there's been any noticeable shift in the enthusiasm for developing engagement with the community during the last decade. So if you think things have shifted in that direction, perhaps you could use the poll function to say yes. Um, and we'll have a, a, a quick count in a minute of, of how that people feel expected, not necessarily um, because of the Communities in Nature program, but perhaps in tandem or parallel with that. Now the next thing I wanted to talk about was actually austerity, and that might seem quite a, a strange thing to talk about. Um, certainly within Europe in the last decade, there has been a real um, uh, emphasis on income generation um, and on reducing our expenditure and trying to meet the needs of a more austere society generally. And it could be in those circumstances that some people have felt that uh, they should cease to do community work and they should focus more on the science which is at the core of their activities. But I would argue that in fact I think it's, it's the reverse. I think during these times of austerity when there are always threats at least of there being cuts to our, our resources, then we've got to really justify what we do. And certainly in, in our case here in Scotland, we've been able to justify what we do to our main funding providers, which is the Scottish Government, through explaining how we meet so many of their agendas, including the social agenda. So the, the Scottish Government is, is, is accessible and we are able to get a very clear idea of what they expect from us. And as well as meeting our targets in terms of scientific research and conservation, our main function, we're able to look at their priorities for other areas, for example, social justice, for education, for health and well-being. These are important priority areas for, for the country, as is economic development and innovation. And we, by having a social role, by having a community engagement function within the garden, we feel that we're also um, engaging with the Scottish Government and we're also helping to support them in meeting their targets, which is helping us, I believe, in, in the, getting the resources that we need to continue going with all of our work. 
it's been really important to us to try and tackle social inclusion and that means we are interested in sharing both our collections and our intellectual property, our expertise. And uh, we'll go back to the slideshow. Because really Edinburgh is, is very much two cities. Um, and these are two very popular images of, of the city of Edinburgh. The first one comes from the film Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. It's about a group of uh, girls from a private school. And it shows the posh Edinburgh, the affluent Edinburgh. And appropriately enough, this group of girls are cited in one of the places that has been identified as being fairly elitist, which is the, which is the, which is the art gallery. The second image, the lower one, is from the popular film Train Spotting, which was uh, fictional, but it was filmed and based on a housing estate, a social housing scheme, very close to the garden. In fact, the garden is a, is in a kind of a gap between the two, between the new town, the elegant Edinburgh, the posh bit of Edinburgh to the south, and the large housing schemes of, of Pilton and Leith to the to the north, and so we're we've got a very mixed group of people coming to the garden, and this is something we want to emphasise that there's a there's a very broad social spectrum, and we're able to work on the social and environmental agendas with this broad spectrum. Also, we are very popular places. The, currently, the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh has, between its four sites, just under a million visitors. This, is a, this gives us huge potential to reach a lot of people, but we're, we feel that we need to expand and develop those audiences as well. What we offer is, is broad. Um, our programming includes everything from visual arts and performance arts to science communication. Um, we do practical fruit and vegetable growing. We do a whole range of health related activities. So we have a broad range of offers and a broad range of audiences as well, but we can always do better. Now, sometimes we will tailor a program to suit a particular target audience if we feel that they're underrepresented. And there are clear benefits from doing this. Um, for example, in common with many science centres and museums, but perhaps not so much art galleries, we found that the age group, the 16 to 35 year olds are underrepresented. Because we think this is an important group, we would like to see more people in that demographic, demographic visiting the Botanic Garden. Um, we have an active programme of encouraging them, partly through the visual arts, so we have an art gallery showing contemporary art, which is very popular with that age group, and also by events. So, for example, we have a, a regular Botanics Lates event, which is a party evening. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Audience development can be about numbers. I mean, everyone is rewarded when you get a large number of visitors. Um, and sometimes growing audiences can be relatively easy. So last year, for example, we ran an event called Cake Fest. It was quite simple. We just asked community groups um, around the city to come up with a cake that represented their community or some iconic building or landmark within the city. Then we created a, a giant map of Edinburgh and we invited people along with their cakes to place them in the appropriate part of the uh, of, of, of the giant map and then we filled in the gaps in between. Um, it was a highly popular event. On a single day we had 16,000 people within the garden. We also managed to attract a, a cabinet minister from the Scottish Government who was here to preside on the, on the occasion. Um, it's the recipe for that one is quite simple. You just 
give people cake and invite them along to eat it and they come in large numbers. But what was important for us was that many of those people we discovered through our visitor surveys had never been to the Botanic Garden before. They weren't people who would come normally. And we also know that subsequently a lot of those people have continued to come back and they've continued to take part in activities here and continue to enjoy the, the, the garden. I wanted to um, say a little bit about how we've succeeded though, to attract particular groups. Um, and, and one group that we were very keen to, to target was parents, young parents in their teens or early 20s who were living in the housing schemes in North Edinburgh and didn't have access to any green space at all. So we wanted to encourage them to, to come to the garden. And the first stage was going out to the community and asking them to uh, take part in focus groups. And we, we did that jointly with a, a community um, organization called the Pilton Community Health Center. And uh, we asked, uh, I just sat back and listened while um, a series of questions were being asked about the uh, about the Botanic Garden. And what we found out is that a lot of people there felt that the Botanic Garden wasn't for them. We got a lot of comments coming back saying that uh, they wouldn't feel welcome at the Botanic Garden. And when we delved a bit deeper, they said that they felt they would be watched here. Now, the only explanation I have for that is that many of them would have come as school children. We have a very active school program and perhaps during when they were children and they were here as, as school children, perhaps they did feel watched. I don't think it's necessarily something that does happen um, uh, with any particular group of people. Um, but then we showed them a lot of uh, images of things that take place here, like the Cake Fest that I've mentioned. Um, like some of the children's theatre performances and circus performances we do during Edinburgh Festival. Um, the Science Festival and other sort of family orientated events and they were actually surprised and, and keen to sample some of that. So we have then arranged transport for groups to come to the Botanic Garden um, and uh, we, we introduced a lot of uh, new folk to the garden and uh, the as a consequence of that, again, we have now a nucleus of people that are acting as ambassadors within the community, bringing their friends and families along and, and being regulars at uh, some of the events that we run. So it was a, from our stage, it was, it was very successful. But that's about just getting people into the garden and perhaps for some of the, 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 the special events. But also what's important to us is providing access to our uh, collections and access to our, our expertise. Um, although we do a lot of events from, from Shakespeare through to, uh, to the, 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 the circus, to theatre performances, to dance performances, we're not a theme park. Um, we're actually a botanic garden and we, we feel that what we've actually got to offer here in the way of our plant collections from around the world is, is our main attraction and that's what we should be encouraging people to enjoy. I mean fortunately botany is not a difficult subject to, to grasp, it's the kind of botany that botanic gardens do at least is pretty accessible. So we try and take opportunities to use our students particularly, our volunteers, and our staff, when they're available, to, to do hands-on explanations of, 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 of what we're actually doing at the garden. And we have a, a brand that we've developed called Real Life Science. And on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, we get scientists out from the, the labs, we get them and we put them on display and they're able to actually present firsthand the kind of work they do. And I think people generally are very accepting that the people who they're interacting with are genuine scientists, not necessarily professional communicators, and they like to hear it directly from the 
from the experts themselves and they're quite forgiving I think if people don't have perhaps the best communication skills although those can be developed and enhanced with training uh, but they seem to enjoy actually being able to ask questions and getting them getting their their responses some of the other more perhaps more novel things that we do and I wanted to to mention um, one of them I think we have an example here is uh, animation um, I, we found that animation is a especially accessible medium so we first experimented that with this back in 1988 when we were doing a, a major event the Glasgow Garden Festival one of the big garden festivals of the of the 80s and we wanted to show our work in, in Bhutan and particularly we wanted to show uh, the story of how important it was that we helped to come up with a new name for a species of, of cypress which has become Bhutan's national tree. So we created a hand-drawn animation using students from the art college and we showed this continuously for the three months of the Glasgow Garden Festival. It was extremely popular, there's something about animation that gets people to, to stop in their tracks and to, and to watch it to, and, uh, and it stimulated a, a, a bigger response than anything we've done since then. So in the last, well since 1988, we've been working with the same animation studio on a number of different animations and uh, the still that you can see in front of you is actually from uh, a film about the, the dry forest, one of our priority research areas in South America. Um, and that has been popular both in exhibition format and on YouTube in both English and Spanish. So I was looking this morning and, and there are a, a very large number of people who clearly access this in the, the Spanish version, presumably many of them in South America. So it's a way of creating outreach on a, on a literal and a global scale. I'm not going to make any uh, uh, apology for our, our using arts. I think arts are a, a very powerful tool to use in putting across science, um, especially visual arts and photography, but also drama and dance. All of these are telling botanical stories and they're attracting and reaching new audiences that we couldn't reach otherwise. And I think that it actually pushes the Botanic Garden's own agenda and our mission to explore and explain the, the world of plants by getting people to look at our plants and gardens in a, in a different way. So the animation is something that works for us with uh, particularly with a younger audience and a family audience. I was going to move on to the botanics lates that I mentioned. This is an idea that we have uh, cribbed from the art gallery and museum world. I think it probably started in London, but I can't be sure. Certainly it started in Edinburgh about five years ago when the National Museum and the National Art Gallery started to do evenings, especially for this age group, for the sort of 21 to 35 year old age group. These are our party events. They take place on a Friday evening. There are bars, there is uh, food, um, there is music, dancing. We have a, a, here we have a silent disco and a Kaylee going on simultaneously. So whatever your type of dance you enjoy, there'll be something there. But also we have a number of activities, science-based activities, many, many practical activities. These aren't necessarily the same activities we would do with a family audience or with children. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, working with, with this particular age group and it being a party atmosphere on a Friday night, we can uh, do all sorts of things that we perhaps wouldn't do with a family audience. Um, so we've experimented with uh, cocktail evenings and we've experimented last time with a, with a special beer that we created using um, beans rather than cereals to try and uh, emphasize during the year of the pulse the importance of nitrogen fixation and and from uh, 
from growing legumes. So, and these have been tremendously successful, um, consistently now selling out uh, a, a, a week or, or two in advance of the event, attracting a large crowd um, set to enjoy themselves and have a good time, but also very keen to pick up stuff while they're here. Um, and it's it and uh, with uh, something we hope to continue um, into into the future. The feedback from that those sessions have been particularly good. Um, and then I want to move further on to uh, to looking at a health agenda. Um, and I don't know how <clears throat> how important that is is for you. But I think um, for us, it is it is very important. And we have another question. I believe we could we could ask here at this point. It would be good to know <clears throat> whether when we talk about a health agenda, whether that's something that you've thought about, whether you're actively involved in that, um, and whether it's something that you'd be interested in exploring, perhaps in the future. So. That's the second question for the poll. If you want to respond to that from your own perspective, how involved and engaged are you or would you like to be in the health and well-being agenda? And I'll say a little bit about some of the things that we're doing here. We dipped our toe into the water with the, with the health agenda when we're involved in the Communities in Nature project with BGCI and the Kalusko Benkiem. We had a project involved involving growing vegetables and fruit, and we wanted to take that further than just the growing and and take it to the to the preparing and, and cooking and sharing of food and to look at generally at healthy diets and a whole series of different um, groups from the community came along to share with us in in the preparation of food, including people from um, parts of society where they have a particularly poor diet and one that is particularly lacking in in healthy fresh fruit and vegetables and we had a very interesting response um, the response to the growing part was unanimously positive I think everybody enjoyed growing most people seem to enjoy the the preparation and the cooking which was went and so but even having prepared and cooked some of the the ve vegetables we still found there was a tend to be in some cases a bit of a reluctance to eat them but i feel we have had an influence there we have helped to to change people's diet a, a, a little bit so we're moving now i think from the simply from an agenda of um healthy eating to look at other areas where we may be able to have an influence um, and I've been personally very inspired by some of the excellent work that I've seen taking place in Scandinavia um, particularly in Nacadia which is here in, 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 in Denmark and in the Gothenburg Botanic Garden in, in Sweden where they're working with people who have suffered serious stress both as a consequences of, of, of work induced stress but also in some cases um, stress caused by by trauma including uh, post-traumatic stress from military personnel this is a, a very important area and I think we're all acknowledge the fact that we do all acknowledge the fact I'm sure that uh, that green spaces and contact with nature is important in helping people make a recovery but i think that exploring the particular role of botanic gardens and diverse collections of plants very special places that can offer something above and beyond what perhaps an ordinary green space can, can offer is, uh, is is very important and i um there seems to be a relationship here between the effectiveness of a green environment and the diversity that's there and that's one that i think it'd be very interesting for us to continue to explore because let's face it at the heart of botanic gardens that's what we're about is diversity and if there is this relationship that uh, that appears apparent in some of the scandinavian work then it's something that i 
would like to um, personally get involved in in the future. Um, we are, we know, facing a, a situation where in many Western countries, and this is certainly applies to Scotland, we have a, an aging population. And we know that that is bringing about huge pressure on our health service. And a lot of the work that, that, that I feel goes on, but we perhaps don't even recognize in terms of botanic gardens offers, offer is, is to do with preventing people reaching a point in which they are needing the services of the of, of a health service so the effect of green space on people's health and, and well-being is very important but it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going on a course of therapy as is in the case in the, in Acadia where the, this slide was um, taken um, it actually is also about people who just visit a botanic garden on their own on a regular basis in order to de-stress in order to uh, be relieved of some of the of the stresses and anxieties that build up in their life and i think that's an important function again it's one that i'd like to see recognized in some way more broadly in terms of how we value botanic gardens and indeed how we value nature in general we've been working recently with a particular target group which is um, adults suffering from dementia um, we haven't been doing this on our own within edinburgh there's a very long tradition of working between particularly between the national organizations so on this particular project we've been working with the national galleries the national museum uh, and the and the national library and by working together, we're off, able to offer weekly sessions, which we call socials rather than anything else, um, for people who are suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and their carers. And we treat everybody as equals during these socials. And we want everybody to get something from it, both the dementia sufferers and their carers. Um, there's nearly a million people now in UK have been registered with, with dementia. It's affecting the lives of many, many more. And this is a number that's growing as well. And so getting involved in this area seems to be uh, an important one from the agenda of the, of, of the government and the health service. But also it fits in very well with what we do best, which is basically giving people a, a sensory and, and tactile experience. So what happens in these sessions? Well, the first thing is that we try and maintain some kind of regular pattern. This seems to be quite important for people so that they feel comfortable, they feel secure. People come each week. There's a format to the to the session. They uh, they start with uh, tea and cake and biscuits. Then there's some practical activity which involves plants. And the person leading this group is our is our herbology lecturer, and a, a lot of it involves very practical things, very tactile things. Um, these things do trigger off memory and ex and experience. But we're very keen not to make the focus on the, on, on the illness, on dementia. So that's something that isn't actually discussed on these sessions. We're also very keen to make it fun and an enjoyable experience for everyone. So everyone goes away feeling better as a result. It's something we'd like to continue to do. It's something that doesn't um, actually cost us a lot of money. And because we're working with three other organizations, we can share the uh, responsibility for promoting and developing the program between the Institute, so it's working extremely well. Um, so let's move on from the aging population to the young, and particularly the, the, the really young, the and, the and the preschool. We've been working um, to try and help develop 
ideas around nature play and particularly for preschool children and parents and uh, as I uh, mentioned um, uh, already we have a particular relationship with a with a group of, of mostly mums um, young mums with preschool children from the large housing scheme in the north of Edinburgh this started at least partly for me with uh, with the growing concern that I'm sure I share with all of you about access that our the, the, the young and ever young group of people have to t technology and uh, much has been written about that recently um, and uh, it's a hobby horse of mine and, and many others because I feel that what we're doing by letting our children have in some cases unlimited exposure to screen-based entertainment and from an ever younger age is that we're creating um, problems in the future that we have we, we, we just cannot imagine what they might be we cannot predict it's a it's a it's a, a huge um, experiment taking place at the moment where people are letting um, very small children have unlimited access um, and I can only fear what might happen in the future and I, I can imagine a point at some point in, in, in the future where we look back at the beginning of the 21st century and we say how could we have done that how could we have let our children be exposed to technology for so long in, in, in such a uh, intrusive form so having got over my rant <laughs> what have we been doing well we've been trying to encourage the use of a small corner of our garden that is uh, has been left to become a quite a wild area it's it's not very big it's no bigger than i think almost any garden anywhere in the world could afford to to put aside um it's less than a less than a hectare but within that small space we have a little bit of meadowland a little bit of woodland uh, and a, a, a pond and a little bit of wetland surrounding it and we publicized that our nature days nature play days and we just let anybody come along on those days we weren't selective in any way we just said come along register when you're here enjoy the garden and most of the people that came at least initially we're expecting there to be some kind of program organized as you would might expect on these occasions and when we said no there's the area go and explore go and play interact with nature we want to see what you're going to do at first i have to admit that some of the the parents there were a little bit confused not so the children the children sort of got mucked in straight away and seemed to have a a really good um, idea of what was expected to them of them and uh, began to explore the environment we had two agendas uh, there first of all we wanted to see whether the children without any um, prompting would be able to interact with nature and these are children many of them who wouldn't have regularly interacted with any kind of natural environment at all so we wanted to see whether it was an intuitive thing whether they would get involved and the other thing, of course, we wanted to do is to see what effect um, a lot of children in one go playing within a limited space and a fairly, what we would describe as a fairly sort of um, diverse and ecologically rich space, whether that would have any, any lasting damage in effects. Well, I've written about this elsewhere. Um, I gave a presentation about it at the Missouri Congress last year, which um, is, has been uh, has been written up. And also, we've, there's a small film that we made, which is available on YouTube. So, if you want to see the sort of full results, then I encourage you to follow those up. Perhaps by first of all looking at the at the film. Um, but in the main conclusion was that yes the children didn't need any prompting that they got involved straight away that uh, often to the to, to the horror of the of, of the of the parents who perhaps themselves had not had much access to nature when they were growing up the children got stuck straight in they were playing with insects and worms and they were getting 
muddy and they were climbing on logs and they were moving things around. Um, it was great to see that interaction and it was sustained interaction. Most of the children that came were here for up to two hours and they sustained that play and uh, very often group activity for a, a, quite a long period. Um, the parents, I say initially, were often a bit confused. They were expecting organized activities. They didn't know what was going on, but they quickly realized that uh, the children were enjoying themselves. And so, of course, they were able to relax and enjoy themselves. And ultimately, it became a social thing as well, with many of the parents coming week after week and getting to know each other and, uh, and bringing picnics and staying for the rest of the day and, and so on. As for the impact it had on the garden, um, that was um, perhaps much less than was expected. Um, we were very careful to follow up each session um, with a, a record of any damage that occurred. And in the immediate aftermath, it was quite clear that there had been 50 or more children um, within the space and things had been moved and grass had been trampled and so on. But the, uh, none of those effects even within the perhaps the more sensitive areas like the hay meadows, um, lasted more than a few days. And, and there was no concern at the end of the project that we'd actually caused any damage. In fact, we, we've still been sort of putting forward hypotheses that it, possibly the disturbance that was caused has helped to keep some of this sward in the, in the meadow area open and allowing further regeneration of, to, to occur. Um, so that was a, regarded as a, as a big success, but I want to finish, um, well, first of all, there's an, another question, I believe. We're going to ask you, this is the, our, our final question, we're going to ask you if uh, within your garden you've ever considered, or whether you have in fact, left a, a space to go wild to allow people to interact with nature and have a real natural experience. So is that something you've ever done or considered doing? Okay, I finally want to end up by talking about a little bit about attitudes and, uh, and how we change them. In, uh, in the preparation for, for this talk, I was uh, invited to look at a video by Mark O'Neill. Mark O'Neill is the head of museums in, in Glasgow and is definitely one of the gurus of access in, in museums and he has charted how things have changed in museums. And he's quite scathing about what he describes as small group work. and I. I, I I guess some of the projects that I've described to you this afternoon, uh, like the work with dementia sufferers and the work with nature play, could be described as just that small group work. And his argument is, is that going to make any effect on the population as a whole? When there are nearly a million dementia suffer sufferers in the UK, when there are literally thousands of, of families deprived of nature living in, within the city, within a stone's throw of the Botanic Garden. And I think unless these things do become mainstream and they do influence the way that we manage our collections and manage our expectations, then I do feel that they have very limited value. So to that extent, I would ag agree with him. But I have witnessed what I believe um, it has been a, a big change in attitudes at all levels within the organisation here in Edinburgh. And uh, I believe there are parallels with that across uh, the world at other institutions as well. Um, you, can, you can dangle carrots in front of people. You can say, we, we will provide free transport, we will provide free food, or we'll provide some kind of special activity and, and, and encourage people to come. But what you really want to try and achieve is to people to come, and to and and to get the benefit from coming um, without necessarily having some special extra incentive added. 
only when you get to that point can you really work on a, on a population scale in getting a lot of making a real difference within society. So I think it's important to determine exactly what our offer is. And for me, our offer is not Cake Fest or Shakespeare on the Lawn or even the, the exhibitions and uh, popular family events that I spend most of my um, work in life organising. I think it's about the, the collections and the expertise that we've got here. And I would say what we've tended to prove, and I believe we have proved, with uh, our programs over the last few years is that that is enough. People are very happy to come here and to enjoy just that, the plants themselves, the, the, the quiet places, the places for contemplation, the places where children can explore, not necessarily anything that we've built. I don't think we need to build a children's play facility um, or create a, a bandstand for performances in the garden. I think it's using the space as it is and just giving people the permission to come to the garden to let them see that it's not somewhere that is exclusive, that we have done all we can to, to get rid of uh, physical barriers to, to access and make it as accessible to people of all abilities. And that the, the, the real thing that they should, uh, that they'll benefit from is from being within the space and being in contact with nature. Um, over the, the time that I've been in the garden, the, the thing that attracted larger numbers of people, a bigger audience than anything else we've ever done was actually the flowering of Amorphophallus last year, the big Arum Titum lily. And uh, it was a good lesson for all of us that the, the, the main attraction, at least in, in that year, was a plant, a spectacular plant indeed. But people didn't seem to mind queuing for two hours to see a, a, a plant that was something a little bit special. I also think we've got to learn as botanic garden managers that whereas perhaps Sometimes we'd like to maintain a safe distance between our, our plants and our collections and the public. We actually have a duty to involve people and that we should actually face any fears we've got. We're very proud of the fact here in Edinburgh that over 50% of our collection is collected from the wild, wild origin materials now over 50% of the plants we've got here, and it's pretty tough in the wild. These plants are used to growing in conditions where they've got to survive animal browsing, they've got to survive natural disasters. Um, and I believe that we sometimes don't appreciate just how tough our plants are. And, uh, and I think that's something that the a lesson that perhaps that we've all got to learn. Not only are plants tough, but they're resilient and that resilience comes from their exposure to change, to disturbance. And so the changes that are, are taking place at the moment, increasing the numbers of people, the types of people, and the level of engagement encouraging people to not just come and walk through the garden but actually to interact with it to feel the plants to smell the plants to crawl under some of the of the bushes and to have that uh, immersive experience i think that's something we've got to learn ourselves that plants are resilient they're going to be able to take that and uh, it's something which we should encourage and embrace rather than be afraid of. Okay, that's all I wanted to say at this stage, but I think we're gonna, if I've, if I've got the format right, the idea now is that people are gonna send me some questions and in the remaining few minutes that we've got of this session, I can attempt to answer the questions. So if there's anybody, how do I get the questions? Okay, 
are they going to come up on the chat thing? Does anybody want to throw anything in at this stage? I see no questions coming up. Lots of great comments. And no questions. I th I'll have to ask you a question, Ian. Can okay. you hear me again? I can hear you, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming I'm not reading any questions. Is that right? I can't see any at the moment, okay. but perhaps okay. people have... That's fine. Who yeah. asked me a question? Um, so we've heard about what you're doing and where that came from. What are, your, what are the next steps? How are you going to build this and take this further? Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. That's... that's, that's... Okay. I think at the moment we are in a bit of a crossroads in that we've done a lot of things to say, a lot of small work, group work, a lot of um, experimental areas. We've worked with uh, Edinburgh University and other universities to, to gather some data together. But I think now it's a question of putting that into practice in terms of our, our policies. And I'm interested in the next uh, webinars that you're organizing as part of this series, because I think um, there is a stage now where we, we've, we've got plenty of evidence about what we can do um, and perhaps what we should do. But I think uh, now putting that into practice in terms of the policies of the organisations, which tend to be a little bit behind, I would say, what we're actually doing in practice. Um, that, that's how I would like to see it developing over the, over the next few years. Now, if you go back to the chat, we have yeah. some questions now. Can you see them? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a question from Hanik. Uh, uh, um, hello, Ian. How do you keep a balance between the new target groups and the science needs? Uh, <laughs> talking about balance, one of the things that we're very keen to do is engage the science uh, scientists themselves. And I mentioned that previously, that we're interested in what we describe as real life science, getting scientists involved. So let's take one example, um, working with the um, 21 to 35 year olds in the Botanic Slates. Now that might seem quite frightening to a scientist because at the same time as trying to do your science communication, you've got in the same space, you've got people wearing headphones, um, doing in the silent disco, you've got people whirling around doing Kaylee dancing, um, you've got people um, drinking beer and, and trying out all sorts of crazy things. We've, you've got, you know, activities that surround you. And in the middle of that, you've got science. And some people would be quite reluctant to do that. But actually, um, those people that are willing to do it really enjoy it and get a lot from it. Because there's something about when people are in a sort of relaxed mode, they're, um, they're enjoying themselves, um, and they're very, that's the state, they're, they're usually very willing to, to discuss things and have a, have a, have a, have a, a, take it a bit further, rather than just sit and watch they'll get into a discussion and that can be very stimulating for the scientists. So by and large, we've been found it's quite uh, easy to get volunteers from our science department who want to get involved and they want to use this as opportunities to highlight the area of science that they're passionate in and those that don't well they don't they don't get involved and that's fine too and <laughs> um, they can this they can be hidden safe away in the labs and in the herbarium and not get involved i'm, I'm looking down now at the at the questions again um <laughs> Someone's asked me the the cost of the wonderful comic mutant movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not animation's not necessarily cheap, but then no kind of filming is cheap, and it's no more expensive than than the conventional filming. Um, we've got a very good relationship with a good animation studio. Um, and when we've got a budget, it's we put it into it. And when we haven't, we 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 make cheaper films. Um, we actually did some animation films with um, the local school for autistic children. Um, it was great. They're, they're some of the funniest, cleverest um, animation films I've ever seen. And we showed them in a public 
galleries and public space to to our visitors for three months. Um, so you don't actually need a budget at all. You've got a relationship and um, with a, with a, with a school or a group that wants to do that sort of thing. But of course, if you have got the budget, um, then you can do the more professional version and the uh, like the the one that I showed a still of the, the dry forest one. Um, the question from Paul is how we finance these activities. Um, we the the budget that I have to spend in a year is is ridiculously small. The amount of budget we get from our core grant funds um, from the government, but um, I've found it's quite possible to get additional funding from a whole variety of sources, um, including various types of lottery funding, uh, various government funding, and then also from um, trusts and foundations like the Kalusko Benki and, and the Wellcome Trust. So it's a combination of, uh, of that. And um, that money that we've raised from those sources has been um, many times more than the actual grant that I'm given each year to spend from the Scottish Government. So we've relied um, very, very heavily on getting in the additional funds for both for staff and for other resources. Uh, all the questions are coming in now and I realise we're running out of time. That's perhaps I should have shut up a bit sooner. Um, there's a question, what recommendations could you provide to raise this forum to people, administrative staff not understand the plants or gardens, neither how to engage with people with it. Okay, well there is always an internal communications job and I'm not sure um, actually how good we are at that. Um, I still, um, I think a lot of people, even within the organisation here, are quite slow to appreciate not only what we're doing, but why it is actually important and why actually our future depends on it. Um, and I, uh, so I do take every opportunity I can to talk to the rest of our staff. We've got quite a big staff here, there's over 200 people who work for the Botanic Garden. And I think every year we have an annual com conference, every year I get up and I give a, a talk if I'm if I'm allowed to. Um, I, I do what, what I can. Some people get it um, and some people don't, I'm afraid. And But uh, one of the things that does um, make a difference, I think, is we have a very close relationship with our, Scottish Government, as we as an organisation are mainly funded by the Scottish Government and it's Scotland's a small country, we're very close to the Parliament and we're able to bring ministers from the government into the garden on a fairly regular basis. And I think that does help our, our colleagues can see that this is something that is of interest, that the community work that we're doing is something that's interest to the Scottish Government um, in addition to the, to the scientific work. And, and 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 so they if we're pleasing the the Scottish ministers then it it'll mean that our level of funding from the Scottish government is likely to continue and that's uh, that's paying people's salaries that's important it's paying their pensions there that's uh, that's an important thing um, so it, it could be seen in some ways as an investment um, that's perhaps a bit of a cynical attitude, but I think I think it is an investment, and that's why I started by talking about austerity and how we can afford to do this, and we have to do this even in times where of, of um, economic um, austerity across the across the globe. Um, time for one more, says Liliana. I, I don't know. Do we go back for one more, or is there one more question that somebody wants to ask, or have we exhausted, exhausted you? I just want to thank uh, Liliana and BGCI for this initiative. Um, I think it's, uh, it's this is a great thing to do, to be able to link to other people. Um, um, I'll go back and read all of the chat afterwards. It's a bit difficult to talk and chat at the same time, but I will do that. And I would encourage uh, anybody that wants to to get in touch with me on a on a personal basis. Um, there we are. There's my details. So that's my email address and my Twitter account. So hopefully, if you want to keep this conversation going with me and ask more questions, then there's an opportunity to to do that. 
Thank you very much, Ian. That seems like a logical place to draw this so close. Um, I don't really know how we do a, a round of applause, but we'll just, here's the virtual round of applause. Thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for attending and we hope we'll see you in the future. Bye. Um,